All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Amy Kramer. I'm a Duke Public Policy graduate, former member of the Duke Board of Trustees, and proud alumna of the Duke Program and American Grant Strategy. I joined the Army team as part of the inaugural cohort of the McKean Fellows, um, through which I had the opportunity to work for nearly two years in the immediate office of the Secretary of the Army. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. But before I do, I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that um, SMA Weiner is also here with us, um, and we're also grateful for his attendance. So now to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, the Honorable Christine E. Warman is the 25th Secretary of the Army. After her nomination by President Biden and confirmation by the U.S. Senate, she was sworn in to lead the military's largest service and be the first woman to do so on May 27, 2021. As a civilian leader of the United States Army, Secretary Mormon oversees the service's $185 billion budget and is responsible for decisions impacting nearly 1 million active guard and reserve soldiers and their families, plus more than 330,000 Army civilians. Secretary Mormon has worked on defense and national security policy for more than 25 years as a career civilian and as a presidential appointee. Her previous roles include serving as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from 2014 to 2016, serving in this capacity as the Secretary of Defense's top policy advisor. Immediately prior to assuming her current role, Secretary Warman was the Director of the International Defense and Security Center at the Rand Corporation. Secretary Warman will deliver some opening remarks, followed by a conversation with Professor Peter Fever, the Director of the Program in American Branch Strategy. And of course, there will be some time for audience Q&A at the end. We're honored to have her here, Madam Secretary. Good evening, everybody. It is great to be here. Uh, and thank you so much, Amy, for that introduction. We've been truly lucky to have Amy Kramer on our team in the Army. Uh, I am happy for you that you're leaving to go to the Office of Secretary of Defense, but I am chagrined with the loss for the Army, <laughs> but you're going on to the major leagues. Uh, I'm also really delighted to be here tonight and want to thank the Duke Program and American Grand Strategy for inviting me here. Uh, as someone who grew up in a college town, my hometown is College Station, Texas, uh, Aggieland. Uh, I've always loved academic surroundings, so it's great to be here tonight at Duke. Everyone knows that this university is a renowned research institution and a global sports powerhouse, but Duke is also a great friend of the United States Army. Year in and year out, your ROTC program produces outstanding new officers, your fellowship program helps boost the career development of our Army leaders, and your researchers help us with developing promising new technologies. There's really only been one sour note in our longstanding partnership, and that was when Duke lured Coach K away from West Point back in the day. <laughs> so we're still bitter about that, although we're like riding the wave of the win over the Air Force, Commander in Chief Trophy, here we come. Uh, we in the Army are also the beneficiaries of the thought provoking work that is generated by Duke's American Grand Strategy Program which is so ably led by Dr. Peter Fever. Dr. Fever is one of our most thoughtful scholars, I believe, in the area of civil military relations, as exemplified by his latest book, Thank You for Your Service, or my personal favorite, his article, Civil Military Relations in the United States, What Seniors Need to Know and Usually Don't, which he co-wrote with co-author Richard Cohn. That article is really one of the best pieces I've read on this subject, and I have literally handed it out to many of our Army generals. It has deeply practical advice for both civilians and uniformed leaders on how to build trust with each other. Public trust in the military is uniquely important to our Army because we are an all-volunteer force. We rely on young Americans to choose to defend our nation. These citizens come from across the country, drawn to the military for a multitude of reasons, whether it be the educational benefits, the technical skills, the financial stability, or a deeply rooted sense of duty and patriotism. Regardless of their personal motivations, each of our service members today made a conscious decision to choose military service. And that hasn't always been the case. 
While not the norm for most of our nation's history, we depended on compulsory service to fight World War II, and we sustained that for 30 years that followed, until the draft became a visceral point of contention during the Vietnam War. And it was actually an alum of Duke Law School, President Richard Nixon, who established the modern all-volunteer force 15 years ago in 1973. Although many critics feared that the all-volunteer force would degrade the quality of our military, it actually made it better. The shift to an all-volunteer force made our warfighters more educated, more professional, and more proficient. And we saw this in the 1990s during Operation Desert Storm, and we saw it over the last 20 years during the post 9-11 wars. Our service members on the ground, in the air, and at sea served with distinction and upheld America's values. As a result, the American military today is the greatest the world has ever seen. And this is not hyperbole, it is not a cliche. I have seen our excellence up close with my own eyes for many years, not just the years that I've been Secretary of the Army, but for years before that. Whether it's been observing our soldiers training here at home or visiting them on deployments downrange. The success of our all-volunteer force should be recognized and celebrated, but it's also come with some costs and consequences. And I'd like to explore some of these successes and challenges with you here this evening, both in my remarks and more importantly, when we have the fireside chat. Back in the fall of 2010, then Secretary of Defense Robert Gates delivered a lecture here at Duke as part of this speaker series. The topic was the state of the all-volunteer force and his message is worth revisiting as we face today's challenging environment. Secretary Gates highlighted the strain on the military, which was then fighting large-scale ground wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. He spoke about the dedication of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who were deploying repeatedly to combat or supporting the continuous rotation of troops and equipment into theater. And he celebrated the professionalism and expertise of the force that had gained years of experience in counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. He also spoke about the shifting demographics of our volunteers and the dilemmas and consequences that come from having so few fighting our wars for so long. Secretary Gates noted pointedly that the country relied on less than 1% of its population to carry the heavy burden of its own defense. And he expressed concern that the military depended so much on young people from certain groups or certain parts of the country, namely young men and women who had grown up with family members who had served, or in regions like the South and the Mountain West, with high populations of veterans and active duty service members. Much has changed since 2010. America's wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are over. We continue to face a very challenging and demanding security environment, but we are no longer deploying hundreds of thousands of young Americans to fight in grinding counterinsurgency campaigns. Yet even as those wars recede, the dilemmas and consequences Secretary Gates identified are still with us. The question of whether the all-volunteer force remains sustainable has taken on a new and heightened urgency as the Army and our sister services grapple with a deep and sustained shortfall in military recruiting. Our problem came to a head in the spring of 2022. We went on to miss our recruitment goal that year by some 25% or about 15,000 soldiers. But the reality is the recruiting problem did not happen overnight. In the Army, the last time we met our mission for new recruiting contracts was 2014. Think about that, 2014. In the years that followed, we dipped into the pool of recruits who agreed to ship months into the future essentially our reserve bank account of recruits. And we continue to draw from that bank account to meet our missions in those intervening years until it dropped to dangerously low levels. We were basically eating our sweet corn. And that's part of why we're struggling as hard as we are to meet our recruiting goals this year and last year. While the Army is not the only service facing a recruiting challenge, we're the largest service, so we feel the impact the most. 
And for us, it is an existential challenge, particularly given the very dangerous security environment that we are facing. We need to build back our end strength so we can continue fulfilling our mission. And the only way we can do that is by recruiting significantly more young Americans to serve in uniform. As an army, we spent a lot of time looking at how we got to where we are today. Some of what we found was surprising and some of it wasn't. For example, eligibility for service has always been limited because of our high physical and educational standards. And we know that eligibility has decreased due to climbing obesity rates and other health issues, as well as a decline in educational attainment that was exacerbated by the pandemic. But among the eligible population, frankly, we were slow to recognize that the labor market had shifted in some significant ways. For one thing, between 60 to 70% of high school graduates today now go on straight to college compared to only 42% in 1973. That means a smaller pool of 18 year olds are even thinking about you know, jobs that are even open to the idea of military service. Data also shows that young people in America are making important decisions, whether it's marriage or job choice, later in life. These shifts have been underway for decades, but the average age of our new recruits around 19 years of age has basically been pretty constant since 1990. So again, this means that the Army is focusing the vast majority of its recruiting efforts on what is only actually a portion of the available labor market. When we compared ourselves against large private sector corporations and looked at how they recruited, we found that we were behind the times. For example, most Fortune 500 companies rely on a recruiting workforce that is self-selected, specialized, and permanent. But the Army has relied primarily on soldiers who are brought in on a temporary basis from other military specialties, and more than two-thirds of our recruiters didn't volunteer for that assignment. We also give them relatively little instruction, and we haven't updated our recruiting methods for years. We are still relying heavily on call lists and solicitations in places like fast food restaurants, gyms, and shopping malls, for example. These methods may have worked for us when unemployment was high, but in today's extremely competitive labor market, they have put us at a distinct disadvantage. The good news is that the Army can decide how we build our recruiting workforce, what tools we give our recruiters, and what part of the labor market we focus on. So with that in mind, last month, we in the Army announced a plan to fundamentally redesign all of our efforts in this area. We're going to expand the pool of potential recruits to include those with education or work experience after high school. We're going to modernize our approach to recruiting by using more online tools and digital job boards. And we're going to professionalize our recruiting workforce by making it a permanent and desirable assignment in the Army with a clear path to future advancement. We're also going to make permanent the future soldier prep course, which we established last year, which gives extra training to thousands of interested recruits who couldn't otherwise meet our physical and educational standards. We're already moving forward with all of these changes. They will, though, however, take a few years to fully implement. But by design, these efforts focus on problems we in the Army can solve ourselves. We are trying to seize our own destiny. But that leaves us still grappling with some deeper and more vexing threats to the sustainability of our all-volunteer force. The most obvious of these threats is a direct result of the end of mass conscription and the shift to an all-volunteer force. And that is America's declining familiarity with the military itself. At the start of the all-volunteer force in 1973, almost one in four Americans between the ages of 17 and 54 had served in the military. Today, it is fewer than one in 20. <clears throat> This means that far fewer Americans know someone in the military or know very much about life in the military. So how do people form a picture about life in the military today? I worry about this because we live in an era where there is growing disagreement about facts, 
where there is a blurring of the line between facts and opinion, and much less trust in formerly respected sources of information. <coughs> Two former colleagues of mine at the Rand Corporation described the collective impact of these trends as truth decay. And they documented in painful detail how truth decay leads to an erosion in civil discourse, political paralysis, polarization, and disengagement from civic institutions. And I see how that erosion of civil discourse and polarization is hurting the United States Army. Getting accurate information about the life in the Army, for example, out to young people who might consider serving is getting harder and harder. Partisan polarization is increasingly putting the Army into the crossfire of the culture wars. It's not clear when those wars are going to end, but they are inflicting a lot of damage along the way. <clears throat> A clear example of this dynamic is Senator Tuberville's hold on all senior military nominations, which has gone on for months and is having tangible negative impacts on our readiness, and more importantly, I believe, on the longer-term health of the officer corps. Dr. Fever is right that civilian elected and appointed leaders like myself should agree to treat the military as non-combatants in the culture of war, and the sooner we do that, the better. <clears throat> the more the military is drawn into the political fray, the more public confidence in the military is going to erode. And it's no coincidence that a range of recent polls have shown that trust in the military is declining. And the more that trust is undermined, the harder it's going to be to recruit young Americans to defend this country. There's another less obvious consequence of our decision decades ago to shift to an all-volunteer force. And that is the trend to an ever-increasing percentage of our force coming from military families. Today, more than 80% of new recruits into the Army come from military families. We are rightly proud of the legacy of our military families, but there are risks that stem from this kind of pronounced dependence on such a small percentage of our citizens. The more distant our professional soldiers become from the broader society, the more we run the risk of developing a warrior caste, one that is seen by the American public as something apart from it, and one that may start seeing itself as a part and perhaps even above the public that it serves. Less unchecked, I believe that this separation can become dangerous. When only 1% of Americans serve in uniform, how much easier does it become for politicians and voters to advocate their civic responsibility to weigh the costs and benefits of the use of force of putting people like you, our sons and daughters in uniform into harm's way. When so few civilians in government have served or are deeply knowledgeable of the military, how tempting may it become for our uniformed leaders to feel they can override civilian input into national security decision-making. Fundamentally, the combination of a lack of familiarity with the military the ongoing partisan polarization in our country and the resulting decline in trust in the military is making it harder to make the case for military service and push back against the perception that the military is somehow the choice of last resort. And nothing could be further from the truth. Our soldiers today are walking, talking examples of the benefits of service. All across the Army, our soldiers are finishing college and master's degrees without student debt and are raising families in quality homes with access to excellent health care. They are training thousands of Ukrainian soldiers to fight and defend their country against the Russian forces. They are standing shoulder to shoulder with our NATO allies to ensure Putin doesn't cross NATO borders. They're exercising regularly with allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific to continue to preserve security and stability in that region. And here at home, Army soldiers, scientists, and doctors led the way to respond during the pandemic to include being the backbone of Operation Warp Speed, a little known fact, but a very important one. Our soldiers are not only in the infantry, in tank crews or flying helicopters. They are engineers, data scientists, cyber warriors, and Olympic athletes. They are Army astronaut Lieutenant Colonel Frank Rubio, who just set the U.S. record for the longest space flight. They are four-star general Paul Nakasone, the director of the National Security Agency, 
and head of U.S. Cyber Command. They are Command Sergeant Major Joanne Nauman, the first woman to serve as the senior enlisted leader at U.S. Army Special Operations Command. They are Lloyd Austin, the first Black Secretary of Defense who graduated from West Point back in 1975. And they are the hundreds of thousands of other active Guard and Reserve soldiers who may not be making headlines every day, but who are finding purpose in serving something larger than themselves. These soldiers grapple with the same challenges facing their civilian peers. But in a society where loneliness and disaffection are more pervasive than others, military life provides camaraderie, a shared sense of purpose, and a support network that equips young soldiers with the resilience and leadership skills that they need to flourish in life. As Secretary Gates said in his address here years ago, our soldiers take on immense responsibility to lead their fellow service members at an age when many of their peers are reading spreadsheets or making copies. That's what I was doing when I was 22, by the way. <laughs> They shoulder these responsibilities because they believe in serving the country. The Army's motto is literally, this we shall defend, a phrase first used in the American Revolution in 1778 and emblazoned on the official Army flag. We live in complicated, challenging times. Democracy itself is under attack at home and abroad. And some may feel that America is no longer the shiny city on the hill. We are not a perfect country, but we have never stopped striving towards our ideal of a more perfect union. And I wholeheartedly believe that this nation is both worth defending and worth serving. As someone who has spent decades as a public servant and who has sworn an oath of service to our country multiple times, I can also tell you that service doesn't always require putting on a uniform but it does often require hard work and sacrifice. I hope that some of you who may still be determining your professional path will consider some form of service to our country. Like Secretary Gates, I would point you to some wise words from John Adams who said to his son, the public business must be done by somebody. It will be done by somebody or other. If wise men decline it, others will not. If honest men refuse it, Others will not. We need more of our fellow citizens, wise and honest women and men, to do the public business. I hope some of you will join in that hard but rewarding work. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Walmart. Well, that was wonderful. And you dangled a number of threads. I want to pull on a couple of those threads. Uh, and in particular, I want to begin with the knowledge gap that you identified there. That increasingly Americans don't know much about the military. I would say they also don't know much about what the Secretary of the Army does. And why do we need a Secretary of the Army when we have a Secretary of Defense? So can you just explain what you do and what you don't do in terms of responsibility? <laughs> Sure. Uh, it's my job as the Secretary of the Army basically to organize, man, train, equip the United States Army. So uh, the Army right now is close to a million people, active guard and reserve. We have an annual budget of $185 billion. That's more than many countries around the world. Um, and it is my job essentially to work closely with my partner, the Chief of Staff of the Army, Four Star General Randy George, and the Sergeant Major of the Army, Mike Weimer, where are you, Mike? Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, SMA Weimer is the most senior enlisted uh, advisor in the United States Army. So the three of us work together to think about how should the Army be organized in the future? How many people do we need in that Army? What kind of weapon systems do we need? Uh, it is our responsibility to make sure that we are uh, building and maintaining quality barracks, housing for our families, that we have all of the kind of support programs. Uh, you know, we we are not in charge, unlike Secretary of Defense. You know, I don't get asked about, um, you know, what, what we should be doing to support the Ukrainians. It's my job to make sure that we donate equipment, if you will, to the Ukrainians, but whether they should get F-16s or Abrams tanks, those kinds of foreign policy decisions are not in the purview of a service secretary. 
and you're 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 not in the chain of command. Say, uh, you know, we deploy forces abroad. What's your role when U.S. soldiers go into combat? Yeah, it is my job essentially, again, along with the chief of staff and the SMA, to make sure that we have ready forces available to the Secretary of Defense and the President. You know, so for example, I was sworn in in May of 2021, and you know, I'm sure you all. Um, watch the news as we withdrew from Afghanistan. You know, it was my responsibility to make sure that the forces who deployed there, the 82nd Airborne, for example, were ready to go, had the equipment they needed, you know, had the right level of manning. Um, and then it is my responsibility to make sure that those deployed forces have the resources that they need to do, to, to execute their mission. Okay, so the Ukrainian policy or Israel policy, not on you, the crisis of recruiting, that is on you. Okay. Very much so. so. You, it's not, I'm not saying it's your fault, but I'm <laughs> saying that's on you to fix. And you, you flag that as, as one of the things that you spend a lot of time on. I want to pull, pull the threads on that a little bit further. Uh, you said it took a long time to develop, uh, but the crisis across the services it is a little different. And so some of the services have had less difficulty than others. And in particular, the other ground service, the Marines, have, have made their numbers this year, I believe. So uh, what to what do you attribute that? What's the difference between how they approach it versus how the Army approaches it? Or is it something uh, else that's going on? No, um, there's a lot to unpack there. But I, I think it's fair to say, first of all, uh, of, you know, I will probably be um, tarred and feathered, if not, you know, quartered um, by saying this. But the Marines, I think, have been long known as being the best recruiters um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but but there are other reasons as well that, that they're not having quite the same challenge as we are. Part of it is the Marine Corps is much, much too smaller. Um, I think the Marine Corps end strength right now is about 178,000, whereas, again, Army active duty end strength right now is 452,000. So we have to bring twice as many young Americans into the force as the Marines do. Um, they, they have nevertheless you know, taken a different approach to recruiting. Um, they send, uh, let me put it this way, it is not a coincidence that the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the, the uniformed officer who leads the Marines, served as a recruiter, as did the Assistant Commandant. You know, there is a, um, a promotion path in their officer corps for people who serve in recruiting. That has not been the case in the United States Army. We have not rewarded that kind of service to our army officers, or frankly, in some cases, to our NCOs. Um, that's something we're going to change, as I talked about a little bit in my remarks. I think another thing, um, there are two other things I would offer um, that differentiate the Marines and the Army. The Marines are, you know, they have a saying, every Marine is a rifleman. Um, they have a very targeted mission, uh, amphibious operations. The Army is huge. The Army has 178 different military occupational specialties. You know, we do everything. <laughs> we have infantry, armor, aviation, field artillery, human resources, lawyers, doctors, nurses. Um, we are so big and differentiated. It can be a challenge from a branding perspective, I would say. You know, it's hard to describe us um, in an elevator pitch, if you will. Whereas the Marine small size, I think, makes that a little bit easier. I will say, though, I also think, you know, the, the Marines branding, if you will, has been very consistent. You know, they're, you know, the few, the proud, the Marines. You see them where they're awesome abs with the guy riding, the, I don't know, when I was in high school, it was the guy on the horse, the knight kind of fighting, you know, video game style. Um, they, they have this kind of iconic branding that has been very consistent. Uh, the Army, we've changed our branding, you know, happily, we're back to being all we can be which I think is a very effective slogan, but like one time we had this army of one, like, does that make sense? You know, we're an army of a million, what's an army of one? You know, so I think you know, we could probably learn some things from the consistency of the Marines in their marketing. So one of my AGS students, who I will not uh, rat out, but it was so impressed when they heard a Marine pitch that they asked, well, how does one join the Marines? Is it that you start out in the army and then if you're really good, you get <laughs> In terms of branding, lots of 
folks uh, look to Hollywood and they say, oh, the Navy really benefited from top. But actually, the airports also benefited. <laughs> I had a Halloween, and somebody used to say that trick or treater came up, you know, wearing a military uniform. And I said, oh, who are you supposed to be? And the little, the little trick or treater said, I'm Maverick, but his uniform said Air Force. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a cooperation, say, with t television or with um, Hollywood? That would, you know, is that an opportunity or not? We would love to find our top gun, frankly, you know, um, and we have been talking to various people in Hollywood about that um, because I think, um, you know, it would help us a lot. Again, when, when so many Americans don't know who we are, having a movie or a TV show that helps talk about that, I think would be very helpful. Um, we haven't yet, I would say, you know, we, we've put a lot of lines out into the water with Hollywood, haven't gotten a bite, you know, and the, and the actor and writer strike didn't help us. It, in the conversations I've had with folks in Hollywood, development of a movie or a TV series can be a very lengthy process. So I think we will still um, pursue those kinds of ideas, um, but we don't yet, you know, I, I haven't figured out what our Top Gun Maverick is going to be. You mentioned social media and, and relying more on that than you have in, in the past. And I'm remembering a, uh, a series of briefings I uh, attended. One was on the danger of TikTok. We've got to get TikTok out of people's hands because of the Chinese. The next one was recruiting and command said, TikTok is our best way of reaching the next generation. So square that circle. How can we make use of social media when there's also a national security concern about using social media. Yeah, <clears throat> the, what we are not allowed to do from a recruiting, we can't uh, have TikTok on our government phone. So, you know, I don't have TikTok on my government phone. Our recruiters are not allowed to have TikTok on their government phones. Um, we, some of our recruiters and some of our soldiers are on TikTok, you know, up in their personal capacities, and they talk about the army. Frankly, a lot of the soldiers talk about their army experiences on TikTok or YouTube or other places. Um, you know, so and in some, I mean, they they talk about their lives. Sometimes that's telling great stories about the army. Frankly, sometimes it's telling not so great stories about the army. Our recruiters can, however, be on. Instagram, LinkedIn, things like that. And we are really trying to make greater use of that. So for example, you know, there's a um, Sergeant First Class recruiter, I think from the Miami area who aggressively, you know, uses social media. Her Instagram account is terrific. There was a fantastic um, Army National Blue Guard soldier who I think is out of West Virginia who does these hilarious spoofs of, you know, there's like some, you know, beautiful Barbie model, like running her hands lovingly over a Rolls Royce and he goes to a striker vehicle and like lovingly, you know, it's hilarious uh, and he's very effective. So I think, you know, we really need to sort of get hip to how we can use social media more effectively to get our story out there and help us recruit. Well, and I don't know if you can make use of this idea. I don't know how otherwise Dr. Price Dr. Major is, but if you look at how the NFL benefited from dating uh, Taylor Swift, <laughs> there might be an opportunity there you should uh, keep it. He generates a lot of attention. As a huge Swifty, you know, I would love to find a way to like get a secretary of the Taylor Swift access. But but yeah, well, I mean, we're we're slowly picking up the superintendent of West Point actually, who is a, a three-star general. Uh, he and his wife for Halloween dressed as Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. So there you go. It's a start. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> okay. Um, on, on an abrupt shift, uh, we, there are some other challenges that, that particularly surveys of folks who said they were thinking about joining, but then uh, are thinking less of joining. And in particular, concerns about uh, bodily integrity. And so this is the sexual assault, sexual harassment. Talk a little bit about what the Army is doing to get their hands on that problem uh, and make that uh, less of a concern for potential recruits. Yeah, we are doing a lot on that front. Um, a, because it's the right thing to do for our soldiers who are already in the Army, but also I think it does you know, hurt us when the perception is that if you join the Army, you will be sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. Um, <clears throat> The most important things I think we're doing are on the prevention side. I mean, what we need to do is stop sexual harassment and sexual assault from happening as much as possible in the first place. So 
we are really emphasizing um, both in basic training when our soldiers go, but also uh, when they go to new units, talking to them about healthy relationship skills, you know, what behaviors, sort of we, we say what right looks like. You know, kids come to the army from all over the country, raised in all sorts of different ways, from all sorts of different backgrounds, and things that may have been okay in their homes are not necessarily okay to treat people. And I think we have to meet them where they are and talk to them about what behaviors are okay and what are not. And so we're putting much more emphasis on that in basic training. And again, you know, in early, um, when, when young soldiers are sort of at their first duty station, you may have heard about SHARP. You know, the SHARP stands for Sexual Harassment and Response um, Program. That, that is really sort of on the other side of the equation. You know, if a soldier has been harassed or assaulted, what do you do? Who, how do you get them help? You know, who takes care of them? What kind of resources do we give them? We've also really tried to um, do some redesigning of those programs. And I think one of the um, most important things we've done on the response side, and Congress had a very large say in this, was to basically take um, prosecution of sexual harassment and sexual assault cases out of the chain of command. And now all of those cases are tried by specially trained lawyers, uh, you know, basically special victims counsel. And um, the, the head of the Office of Special Trial Counsel reports directly to me. So we did this because there was a view that we needed to frankly rebuild trust in our formation. And that if a soldier felt like, you know, <clears throat> there had been an assault and the commander maybe knew both soldiers involved, but liked one soldier better than the other, or thought that soldier was a better soldier, that, that it might inject bias into how we handle the case. By now having all these cases tried by the special trial counsel, that potential bias is removed. You know, I don't think that's gonna fully solve the problem. Again, I think we really need to focus on the prevention side. And a lot of that is having engaged leaders who are out there knowing their soldiers um, and enforcing basically our standards. But we do, we have taken a lot of steps to um, improve on the response side as well. And <clears throat> this question has a dupe connection uh, that you'll spot right away. What about uh, the appeal or how well the military career works with women, uh, young women in particular, who are managing family considerations and an army career. One of the most important things that I think we've done in the Army recently is we have a new 12-week uh, paid parental leave policy. And this is for men and women, um, birth parents, adoptive parents, uh, foster parents. You know, so what this means is if you're a female soldier, you, you have um, six weeks of convalescent leave to recover, that, that we already had. But then on top of that, you get 12 weeks of paid leave to just get to know your baby, recover from the birth, or if you had a cesarean section, for example. And, and now male soldiers have that as well, which is you know really a shift for the United States Army. But for women, I think it's one of the things that um, makes it much more possible to not have to choose between a career in the Army and having a family. Um, and, and it is very possible to um, have a family and have a career in the Army. I have you know, multiple women officers that I have worked with who are also parents and I have public affairs officers here somewhere. Randy, wait, raise your hand in the back. Randy just uh, had her second child, Ryan, a few months ago. and. Uh, was able to take advantage of the new 12 week paid parental leave policy. Um, but I think that's one of the best things that we've done recently. But I would also say, Kramer here, um, before the 12 weeks of paid parental leave, we also put a new policy on pregnancy, postpartum, and parenthood, kind of all of our policies together. And, and it did some very simple things at one level, like just um, allowing women to be able to wear their maternity uniforms for a longer period of time, because frankly, you don't always bounce back as quick, especially after your first child, or, you know, allowing um, more time for um, soldiers who may have had a miscarriage to actually take time off. You know, that's not something that we in our society talk a lot about, um, but, but parents who have lost a child through a miscarriage, you know, grieve as much as uh, someone who loses a child, you know, who's been born. And I think that policy has been very well received and Amy did a fantastic job. I don't know if any of you, you probably don't watch the Kelly Clarkson show, but 
Kelly Carson recently did a fantastic Veterans Day um, episode last Friday, and she spotlighted two of the soldiers who worked with Amy to develop all of that policy, and it was great. I'm so glad you said that, because I'm going to get five bucks from Amy, unless you had <laughs> so, Thank you. But thank you, Amy, for, for what you did. Do keep making a difference. Let me ask you a different question about that. This has been suggested as one of the reasons why the crisis might be upon us now. And this is concerns that the military has become woke. So we've just been talking about mm -hmm. these issues. We've been talking about this and reality. So we've been talking about uh, health care and pregnancy and stuff. And there, there is a perception among some Americans that this obsession with uh, diversity issues, identity issues, is uh, contributing to a view of the military as woke, and that makes the military less uh, desirable as opposed to to serve. So what's your view of that perspective? <clears throat> so a few things on that. Um, we did a big survey about a year ago looking at you know obstacles to service to try to help us understand why were young Americans between the ages of you know 17 and 28 not joining the military. And <clears throat> the biggest barriers we, we found were fear of death or injury, fear of psychological harm, you know, meaning like PTSD, Fear of leaving home, you know, leaving family and friends, and sort of fear of, you know, quote, putting our lives on hold. Uh, and then kind of when you got down to like the fourth, fifth, or sixth thing, depending on, you know, whether you were looking at women or men, you might see fear of sexual harassment, to your earlier question, or fear of discrimination, for example. Um, you know, fear of sort of politically correctness or wokeness was not in the top five or even ten um, issues in most of the data that we saw. Um, so it's not something I think that, and I often ask recruiters that I meet with, you know, is this something that you hear young people talk about? Like they think the army is woke. And I haven't really gotten a lot of feedback along those lines. I do think that um, to the comments I made in my remarks about truth decay and <clears throat> the, you know, distrust in or disagreement about what facts are or the blurring of the line between opinion and fact, the increasing polarization. Um, I do think that, that uh, there's a lot of disinformation out there about what the United States Army is really about or in what we're focused on. You know, the, everything I've seen from the now two and a half years, a little bit more than that, that I've been Secretary of the Army, is that the Army is focused on war fighting. You know, we are we are undergoing the biggest shift from counterterrorism, counterinsurgency of the last 20 years to getting ready to be able to fight China or Russia if we need to. And that involves a huge transformation of new weapon systems, new doctrine, but it's all about the mindset of being ready to um, fight and win our nation's wars. That's what our soldiers are training for. That's what they're out there doing when they're deploying. Uh, I don't see a lot of soldiers spending time on DEI training, for example. Um, but that narrative is out there. And I think, you know, when I talk to the members of Congress, for example, I try to talk to them about what we're really focused on. I invite them to come and see us, you know, whether it's at our installations around the country or to go see us downrange, because I am confident that what they will see is a United States Army that is a ready army, not a woke army. So the, the folks who are making this critique, I think, fall into several categories. There's some trolls, you know, who are just doing it because they, I know why trolls do what they do, but <laughs> too much time. And, and then there's a, I think there's a, a segment of the Republican Party that has figured out that this is political mobilization, um, uh, crack cocaine, you know, it works very well to mobilize the base. So, uh, there's some, you know, political action groups, I think, that are making that critique. But there's also genuine hawks. So that's the, those are the folks I was wondering, you know, what would you say to the genuine hawks? So these are people from the Senate the House who care passionately about a bill. They want to spend more on defense than, than President Biden wants to spend on defense. They want a bigger army, bigger navy. So they care very, very much about defense. Uh, and yet they also are worried that this is happening. So what do you say to those kind of, I won't put a name, but you, you can probably think of several of the senators and uh, members of Congress who are our friends and are worried about this. 
Absolutely. And I, I talked to a, a number of those senators and um, men and women in Congress. And, and again, what I would say to them is very much you know, what I just said. And what I would say to them is, come see us, come look at what we're doing. You know, for example, in basic training, our soldiers spend, you know, two hours on equal opportunity training and 95 hours on rifle marksmanship. You know? And when they go to advanced uh, individual training, they do another 165 hours of marksmanship training and they don't do additional EEO training, for example. Um, I, I, I think it's, you know, when they go and see our soldiers, and they do, I mean, I was with Senator Moran at Fort Riley uh, not too long ago, and, you know, he he saw them doing maintenance in the motor pool. We went and visited some barracks. We They were doing a big, um, basically a, an exercise with an Estonian division getting ready to sort of do what we call a warfighter exercise, which is a division level exercise, you know, and they were uh, out there training. Um, and so I just think that that is a misperception um, that, but, but I also talk to them because I think allowing that narrative continue to continue is harmful. Uh, it, is, it is undermining, as I said in my remarks, it is undermining the public's confidence in the United States military, which in turn makes it harder for us to recruit. And, you know, there's deep concern in Congress. Uh, General George and I were just up um, last week talking to members we are having to make some changes to our force structure as a result of the fact that our end strength has gotten smaller because of recruiting. Members of Congress are concerned about it and they want us to fix recruiting and we're working very hard on that, but we need their help. And part of, part of the way they can help us is by um, talking positively about the things the United States' Army is doing and being accurate about what they're saying about the United States Army. One of the lines of critique that you'll hear, particularly from... And can, I'm sorry, can I just interrupt you? I just want to, one thing I want to say. It's not just, um, criticism is not coming just on the right, for example. Just as harmful as it is to be talking about the army is woke, the army is woke. It's also harmful to get criticisms from the left of every, you know, every woman in the army is getting raped. You know, that, that there is a perception sometimes that comes from the left that you know the army is running rampant with sexual harassment and sexual assault. That is not the case. Or political but, extremists. That's right. Or political extremists. You know, which is an extremely, a negligibly small, you know, percentage of our uniform service. I mean, it is. It is. You know, I I do have some concerns about some extremism, but it's a, a negligible amount. And so, but that I just want to be clear that there are there are harmful narratives on both sides of the aisle. Well, I just wanted to call the one more question in this space, which has to do with uh, things that are taught at the academies or maybe even in the ROTC curriculum. Uh, so you remember uh, there was a hearing focused on should they be teaching uh, critical race theory at the West Point, at the Army Military Academy. Uh, and if you're doing, and the claim was if you're doing that, then that's that's the evidence that it's worked. Well, what's your answer to that? <clears throat> We have uh, <clears throat> one senior elective at West Point <clears throat> that has one two hour module in it that talks about critical race theory. Uh, I think a, a <clears throat> two hours is spent on teaching you know, the basic tenets of critical race theory. And then the next two hours is basically talking about the critiques of critical race theory. This is an elective, it's for upperclassmen at West Point. Um, you know, this is not an, an entire course all semester on critical race theory. And my own view is that we should be teaching cadets at West Point or in our ROTC programs to think critically, to be independent thinkers, to be able to make assessments about facts, opinion, the strength of arguments, you know, I have confidence in our cadets at West Point and in our ROTC programs that you all can think for yourselves and that you all can think critically. I don't think that our cadets need to be protected from particular schools of thought. Um, you know, if anything, I, I need leaders out there on the battlefield who can think critically, who can, who can be um, agile and adaptive uh, and and that's part of what we're teaching by exposing people to different ideas. And so I think a two hour 
elective for an upper class then uh, is not a sign of wokeness. Well, I mean, my answer, thinking back on yours, is of course the military needs to teach about critical race theory. That's different from teaching. Exactly uh, right. And they say, well, why do you have to teach about it? Is it because they're going to get asked about it by senators and members of Congress? And so the senior military leaders <laughs> need to know something about the things that they'll be asked about. And so uh, whatever one's views about the merits of, of this theory or that theory, it's an important argument that has relevance to American political life and our military leaders need to be aware of what's going exactly. on. Exactly. That's my answer. Okay. Tubby, Senator Tubby, you mentioned him in the uh, talk. What's the end game? How do we get out of this? I feel like we missed some easy exit ramps in March, April, May, maybe even in August. There was some things we could do. It feels uh, like you're stuck. And I know, I I'm betting that we're not going to get the nine Republicans. If we get the nine Republicans, we're unstuck. But that's my, my question is premised on the thought that we're not going to get the nine. Well, I'm going to be more optimistic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I hope you're right. You know, I, uh, I hope I'm right, too. Because, you know, as I said in my remarks, and as I said in a couple of other recent public engagements, um, it really is becoming a problem. We had a two-star general who was waiting uh, for confirmation who has put in his retirement papers. And I think, uh, you know, as I said in this last, in the other public engagement, if we don't see resolution of this by the end of the year, I wouldn't be surprised to see more officers uh, put in their retirement papers. You know, I think that one, I, I want to say that um, Tuberville, Senator Tuberville has, has um, been offered multiple, you know, um, exit ramps. You know, he has been offered a vote. Uh, he has been offered the opportunity to make amendments. Uh, you know, and I think he originally, when he first put the hold in place, said that he wanted to have a vote on the policy that was offered to him and he declined it. Um, so I do think there have been efforts made, you know, to try to offer him an off ramp. He has rejected those. You know, I, I think right now the two pathways are the one that you alluded to, Peter, the, the, um, the resolution that's been, I think, voted out of the Rules Committee, but that will require nine to 10 Republicans to join with Democrats. Um, you know, I think there's some causes for optimism. Again, I think Senator McConnell made a comment today that to me didn't close the door on him. Not yet, he said. It's not That's right. time. Not yet. It's not yet time. Well, that leads me to think maybe there is a time ahead. Um, and I think that, you know, um, senators like Senator Ernst, Senator Graham, Senator Sullivan, who went to the floor and basically, you know, tried to call each individual officer by name, I think that uh, avenue is going to continue to be pursued as well. Um, you know, there have been Republicans who said they prefer to kind of see that avenue be the way out as opposed to the to the um, the resolution. So when I talk to my Republican friends about this uh, issue, they say they think that uh, mm -hmm. the issue is working for the Biden administration. That it, at, at a political level, and maybe also for Senator Schumer, that that. They, that this is an issue that is hurting Republicans, that's why they're mad at, at Senator Tuberville, and helping Democrats politically. Now, I know that's not the way it's viewed in DOD. Uh, I'm quite convinced you see all, only the problems, but is there, why do you think the Republicans feel that way? At least the ones I'm talking about. Yeah, well, um, maybe one of them has said that to you. I'm guessing. <laughs> Actually, I, I, no one has said that to me directly, but I mean, I've certainly you know read that there's been a lot of ink spilled on Senator Tupperville's holds. I, I think what I would say is, as a Democratic Biden administration political appointee, I certainly hope that's not the calculus that my Democratic colleagues in the Senate are making, because that is short sighted. It is. You know, this is a national security issue, and we are cutting off our nose to spite our face. Um, if the Democrats think that, you know, it is more important to make political hay on this issue than to, you know, free these general officers to get confirmed. Uh, I, I also think, frankly, you know, the Democratic Party has long been viewed by some as the um, let me phrase it this way. You know, I think traditionally the Republican Party has been viewed as stronger on national security and foreign policy. So it's not in the interest of the Democratic Party to do this, I think, because 
for national security, the right thing to do is, you know, get this hold lifted and get these general officers confirmed. So what do you say that now fitting to your, your general general officers, uh, and not just general officers, but O6s and people who are thinking, okay, I'm gonna try to make it for another 10 years and, and climb the rank. When they ask you, as they've asked me, will the our political leaders have my back or have my family's back? Um, watching this unfold, I'm also old enough to remember the sequester. I'm old enough to remember year after year of continuing resolutions and no you know, strategic development that comes from that. Will the political system have the backs of the men and women that were asking to serve in this way and to sacrifice in this way? What do you say to that? Yeah, well, I, I certainly view that it's my responsibility to have their backs. And I think my civilian colleagues, you know, Frank Kendall, the Secretary of the Air Force, Carlos Del Toro, the Secretary of the Navy, you know, feel the same way. And, and specifically on the Tuberville hold, you know, we have tried to be very visible in having the backs of our general officers. The three of us uh, wrote an opinion piece that ran in the Washington Post over the summer. We went on Jake Tapper's show on CNN and talked about this. You know, we have been, and, and I have had conversations with some of my, with my GOs, both as a group, but also in some cases, individuals who are, who are being held up. And I have, um, you know, laid out in detail the things we are doing to try to resolve this crisis because it's important that they know we have their backs and that they see us out there fighting for them. You know, or they're they're going to vote with their feet. Um, and and the, the you know Secretary Austin, Deputy Secretary Hicks, um, we have been out there fighting, trying to talk to the American public about why these polls are so deleterious, talking to members of Congress about why we need to find a resolution. Um, but I you know I think it's um, we really have to work together with our uniformed colleagues to navigate our way through this hyper-partisan landscape. You know, it's like a minefield that we're walking through together, you know, every day. And it's challenging, but but we have to do it together. You referenced in your speech, but this <clears> is, uh, I've been trying to promote this idea that we should give the uniformed military non-combatant immunity, which requires one party not to target that the military and requires the other party not to hide behind the military, and it requires the military to talk about their values without sounding like culture wars. Uh, so how can you encourage your military leaders to talk about the values of the service, but not in ways that sound like culture wars? <clears throat> it's, um, <clears throat> it is a challenging task right now, I would say. Um, one of the things that I say to my general officers is, you know, and this applies to um, to leaders at all levels, <clears throat> whether you're a general officer or not, is you have to be, you know, I don't want my officers to be political officers. I don't want political generals, but I do need to have officers and NCOs and generals who understand they're operating in a political landscape. Part of what you have to do is, you know, understand the terrain that you're in. Uh, and, and what I mean by that in kind of a practical way is you have to, A, recognize that everything these days gets viewed through this hyper-partisan filter. So you have to think about what you're saying and the words you're using to communicate. Um, because if you're not paying attention, you won't even know what the coded language is, you know. And, and there are ways to talk about our values and to talk about what we're about that, you um, don't require using coded language, but I but it is challenging and it is very complicated terrain. And I think all of us, you know, uniform and civilian, have to be very very thoughtful about how we navigate that. I'm going to ask my last question. There's a mic runner here and a mic runner in the back. If you want to ask a question, I'm going to look for your hands while you're answering mine. But uh, Secretary Warman, you represent one of uh, America's secret advantages, uh, or advantages that doesn't get as much uh, attention as I think it deserves. And that is that we have created a cadre of military def or defense experts who are civilians, uh, who have not served in uniform, but nevertheless are expert on all matters having to do with national security. And thus, we have a very robust civilian control of the military because there's 
civilian expertise, we don't have to rely just on the military. So not looking at these folks who are in uniform, but there's some people who are in left field over here. Uh, what would you say to uh, and front rows, people who want to maybe become civilian national security experts like yourself and want to have your career? What What's the best way to get started? That's the question. And now I'll look at it. There, there is no um, no straight path to sort of getting, uh, certainly my path was not straight. You know, if you had asked me when I was 25 years old, you know, do you think you could be the secretary of the army? I would have laughed out loud. Um, I, I think, you know, I would say a couple of things. One, national security and foreign policy is an incredibly dynamic, fascinating, meaningful career field. And so, you know, I would absolutely encourage, you do not have to serve in uniform to be a part of that community. Um, I have never served in uniform, and I, I would encourage you to come on in, the water's fine. I, I do think, you know, it is very, very important to listen and learn. You know, I, I started in the Pentagon when I was 25 years old. Um, I worked alongside, in you know, my very first assignment, I chose to go into the Joint Staff. Some people said, oh, don't go to the Joint Staff. You know, it's all uniform, kind of like, that's like jumping into the deep end of the pool. Um, but I wanted to go there because I knew I didn't know anything about it. And um, I took every opportunity when I worked alongside officers from all of the different branches to keep my mouth shut, keep my ears open and learn from them. Listen to what Army life was about. Listen to them talk about their their deployments, you know, and part of the reason I put the quote in there from from Gates about, you know, they're beating peers while the rest of us are doing spreadsheets and making photocopies is because that's exactly how I felt. You know, I was 26 years old and I was talking to these people my age who were like captains, who were interns. And I'm like, man, you guys have commanded like 150 people, you know, and I'm like sitting here like making coffee. Um, but, but, but You're I, not selling the job. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, I like to make coffee. And then when I was 26 years old, I got the Romanian Minister of Defense about how he needed what he needed to do with his military to transform it so that he could join NATO. You know, but I but but what I'm saying is I think to be a civilian and to be effective and credible with your uniformed colleagues, you have got to learn, 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 be a sponge, you know, be a sponge and pay attention and then become expert in your portfolio, whatever it is, so that you know, because that's, you have to be excellent in what you do to be successful in the national security community. Um, but I think, again, as a civilian, you really have to listen and learn. And, and Peter, you've written a lot about this. Um, part of that is, you know, you, you have to have the trust of your military colleagues at all levels. And one huge way to gain that trust is to show them that you know what you're talking about and to show them that you'll listen to them you, that you value their different perspectives. You know, if you just roll in there as a 32 year old political appointee who thinks they know it all and has never even been in the Pentagon, they're gonna blow you off. Um, so, you know, but it is a great field. You can absolutely have a dynamic, successful, wonderful career. And I would encourage you to look at it. I came in through the Presidential Net Management Fellows Program. There are other things like the McCain Fellowships, Boring Fellowships. There's, there's a, a number of terrific pathways. And I tell my students, don't sneer at making coffee. As you climb the ladder, you'll make coffee for better and better people. <laughs> so uh, there's one here. Let's take the one here and the one here. We'll take two at a time, and, and then you'll you combine them. Yes. So. Madam Secretary, Madam Secretary, Cadet Claudia Pauly from Chapel Hill ROTC. I was wondering, as information flows more freely than ever, how is the Army promoting our operational security and preventing our OSIN from being exploited outside of just regular annual trainings, you know, TikTok on government phones, and having leaders lead by example and vigilance? Right. And a great question. And the Chinese can buy <laughs> data for a penny. Uh, you know, I think that. Oh, well, I was going to get the second question. Oh, so we'll get to it. Oh, yeah, okay. We'll get a penny. Uh, my name is Devin, thank you for coming. This is my first time coming to something like this, and it's quite cool. Um, I have two questions. Um, it's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> this has one, so we can get more fun. Okay, sure. Uh, I was wondering how much of the Army's expanded budget is being poured into technological developments in the private sector to companies like 
shield AI or Angular or other other things that you might have seen as your tenure at, in the second part. Great, great question. Yeah, great question. Okay, so no. a couple of things. So on yours, um, you know, one of the biggest lessons learned out of Ukraine is that the battlefield is transparent. You know, we we can see our enemy all the time. They can see us all the time. And part of why that is true is because of there's just so much volume of open source information. There's so much signal out there of all kinds. And I think um, beyond sort of the annual trainings and things like that about information security, we really have to sort of shift our mindset that if we're going to be effective on the future battlefield, we have to you know, protect our information. We've got to focus on cybersecurity. We have to focus on information security. You know, we may not always have a situation where our soldiers can deploy with their phones. Because if you're on your phone, you know, looking at Facebook, you can be targeted. Um, so, so I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of making that mental and cultural shift. But we are starting to sort of bring those lessons learned into our combat training centers at places like Fort Irwin in California or Fort Johnson in, in Louisiana. Um, and, you know, starting to put that into our brigade exercises uh, to try to really sensitize everyone to that reality. Um, uh, I don't have a dollar figure for you off the top of my head, but for example, about 40% of the Army's budget every year is spent on modernization and procurement, developing new weapon systems. Um, and we absolutely are working with companies like Andrew, for example. Actually, I have a friend, uh, Zach Mears, who used to be the chief of staff for Bob Work when he was deputy secretary of defense, who works for Andrew now. Uh, and they are doing some great work for us. We also um, do a lot of work with Palantir, for example. Um, they can be kind of expensive, but they do great stuff. Um, and I think, you know, one of the six objectives I put out when I first became Secretary of the Army was to become more data-centric. You know, we've absolutely we've got to embrace data, data analytics. We've got to modernize our networks. We have a huge amount of work to do. You know, we, we've got to embrace machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, and so we are, we are putting a lot of focus on that as we, as we tr uh, transition from sort of the big eight weapon systems that were developed in the eighties, like the Bradley, like the Abrams, the Apache helicopter to new systems that we're building today. Okay, who Dr. Colbert has up there. And then this person here, yeah. Jimmy, may have the chicken first class fetch. Uh, North Carolina State University and ROTC. Uh, I have a question about Project P-Lay. It's the Army's first foray into nuclear energy in several years. And with microreactors camping around with new technology, can you maybe speak on the Army's approach to safety, especially if these microreactors might be in hot combat zones? I'm guessing another submariner in the future. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Madam Secretary. My name is Yaki. I'm a first year student here. And I was just wondering if you could speak to the existence and the effectiveness of public and private partnerships in um, involving the efforts to be on. Sure. <laughs> so, midshipmen, you have totally something. I do not know what Project Pele is. Um, you know, what I will say, so I apologize, I'm not going to be able to give you an insightful answer, but I don't want to try to BS you. Um, you know, what I will say is the, the Army does have a lot of nuclear expertise. Uh, and, you know, we have, we have a, quite a bit of um, work that we do on nuclear, biological, chemical warfare and things like that. Um, so I'm confident that we have quite a bit of expertise around nuclear energy safety and things like that, but I'm afraid I'm not familiar. I'll have to like take that as an RFI back to my staff on Project Gateway. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer. Um, you asked about public-private partnerships, right? <clears throat> you know, we, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis recruiting, right? I, I think this is an area where one, a couple of places I think have some real potential. First of all, there are a lot of veterans organizations out there uh, and, we have not really developed, and I think we need to, a set of strategic partnerships with these veterans groups to help us with Army recruiting. You know, veterans are obviously um, a, a huge pool of influencers. 
Um, there, there are some veterans, I think, right now, you know, going to some of the questions, Peter, you, you raised about sort of views that the Army is woke, who are skeptical, you know, and are maybe not as enthusiastic about um, encouraging young people to join the Army. So I think it is in our interest to reach out comprehensively and in a structured way to those various um, veterans groups and form a partnership with them that would be about helping Army recruiting. And it's not just, you know, American Legion and VFW, you know, which tend to be more some of our older veterans. It's things like the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, for example. You know, that's something that is on the to-do list for us. Um, I also think another area where we could probably do more for um, public-private partnerships is with community colleges and other, um, you know, public or private um, educational institutions, because we do want to put more focus on not just high school kids, but you know, folks who have gone on to community college or maybe started college but didn't finish for whatever reason. Um, but again, we, we have kind of a little bit of a um, thousand flowers blooming. You know, we have some very strong relationships with universities and community colleges, but it's not as um, structured and comprehensive as I think it needs to be. Okay, last two questions. One back here and then one in the back, and that will have to cap it off. Yeah. Good evening, Madam Secretary. I'm Officer Candidate Kellen Kloss. I'm a uh, enlisted officer student with the NC State Navy ROTC. And uh, I'm okay. the Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, we still teach navigating by the stars or navigating over land with just your thumb on a compass. And I'm curious in the modern era how the Army is maintaining independence from technology. We, I just got school. Oh, hold on. Oh, sorry. sorry. I'm so excited about land now. <laughs> I'm not uh, thank you for anything else. I think it's a great <laughs> Kind of hear your thoughts at a strategic level. So, uh, with that, I'm Master John San Juan out of uh, Fort Liberty for the National Defense University, uh, the master's program for strategic studies. Uh, my question is kind of going for recruiting, right? We talked about the initiative that the Army or the Armed Forces is going after, uh, but more so for the soft enterprise and what that looks like. We're hearing you know, 10 to 20 percent cut within the, the soft enterprise. So, what, what does that look for in the future? Uh, given the complex and dynamic uh, aspect of what the world is today, right? We have the, you know, we can look at it from the forefront, you know, but uh, we have China, we have uh, Russia, you know, as an acute threat, both militarily, but from an economic standpoint as well, uh, Israel, Hamas, and Russia, and Ukraine. So, kind of looking at the, the, the so soft and yeah, that. great question. So, um, how are we sort of going back to the basics? And uh, the expert is up there, uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, Mike Weimer. But I was just getting schooled on land navigation. Um, and we are really trying to put greater emphasis on land navigation with our soldiers. You know, we have not put as much uh, focus on it in recent years as we need to. You're exactly right. You know, we may not have GPS in a contested battlefield. We need our soldiers to be able to navigate with just a, a map and a compass to be able to do it at night. Uh, that's something that our special operators are extremely skilled at, but we don't always have, um, you know, our soldiers in the conventional units as skilled um, in that kind of navigation. And so we're, we're really bringing that back and going to be putting more focus on it. Um, on, you know, to special operations, <clears throat> we, what we're doing, there's been, I think, some misinformation in the press about what exactly we're doing in terms of special operators and reductions. Um, when I came in as Secretary of the Army, we were, um, our end strength was supposed to be 485,000 soldiers. You know, the reality is we now only have 452,000 soldiers in the United States Army. So we have some sort of hollow structure that we need to get rid of. And the reductions that we are making to the special, so we are reducing overall almost 30,000, what we call spaces, um, as compared to faces, actual soldiers wearing uniforms. We've got to get rid of 30,000 spaces on our books. 3,000 of those are going to come out of the Army Special Operations community. Um, and in some cases, what we're doing is we are, uh, there are positions that the special operations community hasn't been able to fill from a recruiting standpoint. So we are going to take those off our books. The special operations community grew 
enormously over the last 20 years, as well it should have, we needed it to for the global war on terrorism. You know, now we are, special operators are going to remain critically important. They are critical to competing against China, for example, or Russia. We need um, psychological operations. We certainly need Green Berets. We need the Night Stalkers. We are not getting rid of those positions. You know, what we are doing in some cases is looking at we may have PSYOPs folks who are focused on print media. You know, I think most of us agree. How many people here read print newspapers anymore? Anybody? No. Okay, a couple people. <laughs> mainly on, you know, you're, it's mainly all about digital. So, you know, we looked at what we had and said, hey, maybe we don't need those spaces associated with print media in our PSYOPs forces, for example. So, yes, we are eliminating 3,000 positions but we are not lim eliminating any Green Berets. We're not eliminating the 75th Ranger Regiment. Um, you know, we are really trying to make some very targeted reductions that, that, that we assess and the SEC staff assess can be made in part because again, we are shifting from a focus on counterterrorism to a focus on large scale combat operations. Well, Speaking of land nav, I need to land that you to your next <laughs> engagement. But we need all these things that you said. We need uh, you at your post as Secretary of Army. Thank you for what you are doing. And uh, please join me in thanking you.